Welcome to our webinar presented to introduce Nanjing artist Liu Guofu on the occasion of his latest solo exhibition, In Praise of Blankness, a discovery of the mystics of his abstract painting. It is a great pleasure for me to share this panel with two experts of Chinese art and history. Dr. Malcolm McNeil, Director of the Postgraduate Diploma in Asian Arts, Senior Lecturer in Arts Education, School of Arts, SOAS, University of London. Malcolm has professional experience at several of the world's leading museums, such as Victoria and Albert Museum, and art market institutions, such as Christie's in London. Malcolm and the SOAS team have been supportive in bringing academic expertise for our Chinese contemporary art and in art exhibitions over the past two years in London. Dr. Joshua Gong, the research editor of Unicom Publishing Group, is a leading expert on contemporary Chinese art. He was a lecturer in the art history department of Shanghai Normal University and the University of Success. His monologue, Iconography and Schemata, a communicating history in painting between China and the West, 1514 to 1885, is a recognized landmark in the field. Joshua, as the artist suggested the title In Praise of Blankness for his latest solo exhibition, what do you think or how you interpret the theme? Okay, thank you, Calvin. I was very much inspired by the artist, but before I saw his work, then I have this feeling, but I can't explain it in a legible way. It's, it's something ineffable. I can't explain, but I can feel it. There's... Um, very deep uh, Chinese, ancient traditional Chinese way, especially the literati way of observing the, the relationship between the individual and the society, as well as between uh, nature and the culture. So in, in, in Chinese cultural concept, we do not distinguish uh, too much or make it as a dichotomy saying, nature versus society or culture. And uh, when I view Wofu's painting, I can see he's trying to blur the boundary between those two very distinct um, fields, especially uh, being developed in West, modern Western uh, society in after the 18th century. Then, I was in contact with artists discussing his work and he suggests uh, there is a book by a French sinologist and philosopher, um, Francois Julien, uh, Elodie de la Fadure, which is in praise of um, blandness. I think the uh, philosopher, he himself captured the essence of this Chinese spirit while Guofu's visual language represent such a feeling and it served as a open discussion for us to understand this is not just some unique Chinese uh, concept or approach or Chinese way but also it's a universal it just in during the development of our society especially in the industrial one this kind of idea has been eclipsed by uh, positivism or materialism at a point. But now we are in, a in the 21st century, then uh, the world is very deeply linked and uh, globalized. So this is something we shared by, uh, shared by all communities and societies with different cultural backgrounds and national identities, but we can recognize it because we are uh, a, in, a, in, a, in a globalized human society. So I think he articulated or this notion is very suggestive while it can help us to understand his um, artistic uh, invention in this um, particular area. So Guofu, he emphasized that he wanted to uh, share with his audience and collectors that he focused on how to paint rather than what to paint. In this case, we, as audience, we try to 
uh, read or appreciate his work by knowing how rather than what to expect from the surface. So that's what I thought when I was trying to comprehend his work, uh, especially the emotion uh, being uh, conveyed from the, the surface so that I can feel something deep and um, try to elaborate a little bit further. But our audience or anyone who see Guofu's art shouldn't be limited by my view. <laughs> I'm just uh, trying to give us a cue to understand a method to approach rather than a narrowed view saying this is what how we how we do it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I also found blindness, this term, very interesting, especially when I started to work with Liu Guofu since 2012. And I remember the first time I saw Liu Guofu's work is in 2011. Um, when I visited in Beijing, Shanghai, and Nanjing. And I do appreciate the word blandness because um, the subtlety uh, from Liu Guofu's painting actually delivers such um, sense and also the aesthetics. Um, also, I remember um, Dr. Xia Kejun once said, uh, mm -hmm. Liu Guofu's painting is like infusion of light and qi. So we Chinese, yeah always talk about qi, but it's about the energy and also very atmospheric as uh, something like the light with air. So while light brings out its depth, uh, air helps disperse the lights to every corner of Liu Guofu's work. And also the colors, the iconic uh, blue grayish color Liu Guofu used is actually very calming, but then it could also be very dynamic. Um, well, um, especially in the last two years when I saw Liu Guofu's um, works began to evolve and from very subtle to you can see a very dynamic brushstrokes. Um, I definitely want to share or discuss with you both how you see this blandness, uh, how you interpret this blandness to you when you see Liu Guofu's painting. Um, yeah, like Malcolm, um, do yeah, you have- thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. No, I mean, I think it's they're they're wonderful works. They're they're works that I spent a small amount of time with, but the time was very memorable. They're extremely compelling, and I was really struck both in your comments and in Joshua's comments by the way you both focus in on the kind of the emotional impact of these paintings, of these canvases. These are something that you know draw you in. They require your attention, and they're quite immersive and impactful. They're they're not immediately legible. Again, they don't they don't translate into kind of iconographies or or particular structured forms they imply them you know in the series this latest series rocks flowers these are very explicit iconographic subjects you know we know what this is on a certain level because we've been told it by the artist we have this voice of absolute authority that tells us this is a rock this is a flower but yet the way that we respond to it is so different from say other contemporary artists like Liu Dan, who paint these sort of almost hyper-realist ink paintings of, of scholars rocks. This is something profoundly different from that. And that's partly, I think, down to media, partly down to the artist's sentiment. And if we're to circle back to this title that um, you've applied to the exhibition that the artist came up with himself, which I was first, as a side note, absolutely fascinated to hear. It comes from a French sinological text. I mean, that slightly blew my mind because, um, you know, this, this, this concept to me, it pulled me into very, uh, very different areas of thinking than 18th century French scholarship or 19th century French scholarship on, on China. Um, so in short, I think, yes, there's this blandness, as you put it, um, uh, Dan in Chinese. When I was preparing for this discussion and, and doing a bit more background research on the artist, the, the places I was going to were not the sort of the a, a reaction to the empiricism of the 18th century. It wasn't about kind of getting to, beyond the uh, the, the scientific optical perspective, our, our predilection to look and look and look closely and assume we understand things because we can perceive them, uh, you know, that, that trusting our vision in a way, it was, it was much more of a, a kind of desire in preparing for this discussion to go and look at much older texts. And in fact, it was the, 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 the very text that got me into the study of Chinese culture in the first place, the Tao Te Ching that I went back to. And particularly in verse 35, I think there is, there is um, kind of injunctions that talk about this ineffable way, this ineffable Tao as being Dan, as being bland, as being 
And that's where the term starts to unravel for me and the difficulty of translation, whether from French to Chinese or Chinese back to English or where we find it, that this, this core concept um, at the center of this really compelling exhibition is, is as ineffable as the paintings themselves, that it carries with it so many different implications that you know, we can talk them round in circles and circles here. But of course, the thing you all have to do is to, to go to either 3812's website or to their galleries and see these paintings in person to have this experience. But that dan, that that blandness, as we might call it, or perhaps, um, you know, dilution um, or even dissolution, it's it describes a kind of at its root. It's the um, the, the 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 reduction of the concentration of something. And it, it sort of sits somewhere between dilution but also by implication in Lille's work, in distillation. Um, so I guess in a very convoluted way, what I'm trying to say here is that these works, um, as Joshua put much more eloquently than I have, and, and Calvin underscored, are, are so emotionally affecting that while the title actually did cause me to kind of raise an eyebrow the first time I heard it, you know, why would you call an exhibition uh, centre on blandness? Is that is that very tongue in cheek or is this something, you know, whereas actually it's speaking to something that requires our attention. And, and when you're in front of it, something that compels our attention, that pulls you in, and it pulls you in with this kind of subtle simplicity of, um, of color and light and structure and form that is breaking down kind of complex structures, whether they be rocks, whether they be flowers, whether they be landscapes, um, whatever form Lille has kind of turned his brush to, that instead pull you into these immersive pictorial spaces that are actually kind of also subtly three-dimensional because they're oil paintings. There's a sense of, of light and form and volume, but also texture there. So I think for me, it's the, you know, that emotional affect that they have when we encounter the paintings that makes this title, this, this idea of blandness, initially one that I was, you know, slightly kind of raising an eyebrow at, then thinking, well, okay, maybe this is drawing from, from ancient Taoist philosophy. Now I have to rethink my thinking because it's actually situated in the artist's understanding of a much more complicated, much more international way of, of thinking about the concept. But fundamentally, it's about our, our immersive emotional experience in these dilute, but also pure spaces that we're kind of pulled into. You know, all, all three of us have them as backgrounds to our our presentation just now, these three different series of, of the artists that we can we can see in this discussion that provide very different kinds of emotional impacts, but equally pull us into these spaces that requires to kind of look and linger and stay. And um, yeah, that's my my response to it. I think to really echo that, but but think about dilution and dilute, you know, allowing yourself to be absorbed into that dilute space is one of the things I find so so compelling and so um, so arresting about the artist's work. I actually want to add one more point about the dan, the blankness. To me, it's more like um, an emotional state of, um, of, of the artist himself. It's also something about um, the quality of the aesthetics from our tradition. Um, mm. Georgia mentioned about the literacy. Um, it's, it's the moment that I found Liu Gofu may also embrace that spirit and that quality. Mm. Um, to show his emotion and also his humanistic concern through his paintings. That's why I, I would see um, from the emotional perspective, um, no matter how dynamic or how strong the brushstroke or how fermented, and then the, this, this blandness is always with the artist, um, as this is the artist's quality, very sophisticated, very elegant. Um, it's very really long lasting, aftertaste, eternal. That's, that, that, that's how I feel. Um, mm. But when we see um, the artist, when he used very chaotic brushstrokes, um, very fermented, um, Georgia, I think you also have a different interpretation when you see these brushstrokes and the, 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 the texture of the, of the canvas. So um, you introduce the term entropy, right? So, so how do you come up with this term here? Uh, there are two, there are several uh, concerns why I come up with this term, because I was thinking how to summarize Guo Fu's uh, looks like simple, but a very sophisticated uh, visual representation. Because when I look at his image or painting, uh, a color field, I can see it's very calming, but it's not fixed, it's moving. So visually, you can feel it's very slow motion uh, movement there. Uh, 
and it's very similar to Leonardo da Vinci when he painted um, the the water. Uh, why he trying to understand water, then try to slow it down to observe the movement. And I was thinking it must have something to do with energy or the way we understand how the universe moves. And um, then I think about the the very original or very beginning of the inquiry about the universe, how it moves, then uh, entropy is something I think is suitable because we have a artist as a thinker or, or mediator who pull the information, perceive the vast information into his brain, then he uh, digest, then try to find a simple way to show us what it's like, mm -hmm. then transformed from his thoughts to his hand, then work it out. And I think this is, uh, this is in part, is something to do with counter entropy effect because entropy suggests chaos. We need to, um, in order to maintain the order or to make ourselves comfortable, we have to do something. Then even though as audience, we see it's very calming, but I can see the, the artist struggle when we think about it, how he try to do something new while in contemporary uh, art field, there's so many of them, so many intell intellectual um, artists work on this field, trying to understand, to present the so-called the truth of uh, our life. Um, now, it is not easy. Then in order to uh, make such an inquiry while not only just breaking the rules, uh, but also to give a suggestive or constructive solution itself is not so easy. So I think entropy itself is in part uh, very uh, associated with what he was doing. Uh, secondly, um, I think also talk about engagement, especially with Western ones. I think, mm. I think science is something uh, we can agree upon from, from, both, uh, from both Chinese and the Western uh, intellectual circles. When we, we especially at the very beginning of the 20th century, when China is trying to um, reinvent the national culture, they think science is very important. And but to understand science, not just narrowly focus on science, but how science going to uh, complement our way of understanding humanity, that's more important. I think entropy itself is not just a, yeah, it, it rises from, the field of physics, but it has much wider meaning. Um, eventually, it, it suggests how we understand uh, organic uh, or, let's say, uh, biology in a, in a wide scope. Um, I think that's the reason why I particularly uh, selected this concept, not only for us to understand, but it is also uh, very appropriate in interpreting and explaining uh, Guo Fu's art. So, mm. uh, we could have a very contemporary, while uh, solid uh, understanding about his work. Well then, uh, Joshua, will you compare entropy and blankness? Because it seems like two different concepts. Um, are they conflicting or are they complementing? Uh, I, I mean, um, in this contest with Liu Guofu's paintings, I think uh, it's complementing rather than com uh, a high contrast uh, mm. because I think the reason why Chinese society or Chinese intellectuals, they can have this blandness is first of all, they admit there's entropy. There's something out of our control while we still try to make it, uh, make the relationship harmonious, even though we admit uh, there is something not harmonious there. The understanding itself, it's some of the things they are, uh, let's say the physical or the external world is not exactly at your disposal, not entirely at your disposal, uh, but you can try to position yourself into this uh, slot that you, both you and the inner world and the external world feel happy 
of feel uh, less um, struggling, which also represents in his uh, on, on the canvas, Zhang Guofu, when you look at it, you feel yourself calm down. It's not because the the external world or our metropolis is calmed down by itself. They they still work on their own way. And uh, individually, we might seem very insignificant uh, in a vast society. Mm. Uh, to put it that way, if I die today, the world still moves. So it doesn't matter. But I think the idea of admitting this and try to understand and to live this way because you realize the truth of the, the the harsh world while you still feel happy to live on that is a great will to this life or to uh, this uh, surrounding while blandness is something to do with that because when you admit it you feel less anxious mm. You feel less struggled because you already know what's what's going to happen. The only thing you need to do is try to live with it, find the best way to enjoy, to find the truthful meaning uh, of this life uh, while filtering those uh, chaotic or not so useful information. Information by information, it could be visual, could be verbal, could be audio, something like that. So I think mm. those two concepts they do complement each other once we know uh, the philosophy behind it. Yeah, and yeah, Malcolm. Um, yeah, Joshua, I, I, I think I love that that comment, and I also that kind of um, your your quite frank comment of you know an entropy you know conceiving of modern society as a, a system with entropy operating in it you know that and also that that quite candid comment of if I die today the world continues moving those um, I mean that makes me think about or it prompted me to think about, you know, how, how I think about entropy and, and then to come back to Leo Goffel's work that at least my very basic understanding of the concept is that entropy is a law of thermodynamics, that um, it refers to energy contained within any contained system, whether that system be an experiment, whether that system be a city, as you describe it, whether that sy system be modern human civilization or that system be the the entire kind of universe in which we exist, that everything in that is tending towards a stable state of the minimum complexity, that everything tends to towards what you describe as disorder. But I think in some senses it's only disorder when we center human experience within it. If we center this kind of idea that we as thinking cognate combinations of molecules and things are, are the kind of the, the, the principle around which the universe is ordered, because it is the principle around which we order everything. We center ourselves in what we do and center humanity. But I mean, this seems quite convoluted, but, but bear with me for a minute, because I think to come back to Calvin's question about where does entropy, where does this kind of collapsing of order um, into the most simple possible arrangement relate to blandness, relate to the dilution of, um, well, literally kind of the, in the Chinese term, the dilution of a liquid to a, a kind of a, a very kind of dilute state. Um, where do those connect? And in the, again, those kind of, the, the, perhaps where I was overreaching in, in researching this topic to go back to those early Taoist texts, this idea of the, the Hun Dun, the kind of the primordial chaos from which mm. um, all things emerge in, in classical Chinese philosophy is remarkably mm. similar in my, my very naive understanding of both early Taoist philosophy and of, um, of, 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 of thermodynamics, that this kind of tendency towards chaos has a parallel there. So at a conceptual mm. level, there's that, that linkage, but where does that connect to the artist's work? And, and for me, there's this, this difference that on one level, if I really try and think about what entropy means and, and apply it to myself, I am utterly terrified. Like I am, <laughs> I, I find that, that notion that everything is tending towards kind of the, it's, it's, it's completely blows my mind. And it fills me with fear because of the vanity of my own desire as a, as a human being to continue my own existence. And, and the idea that I and everything I know and everything I could know and could understand will eventually collapse to the most simple arrangement of molecules is, is terrifying. Um, or not even molecules of, of, of neutrons, protons and electrons, whatever that may be. Again, I don't really get this stuff. But when we come to Leo Goffel's painting, um, when we look at that, that simplicity, that blandness, which does have a conceptual link to that concept, the emotional impact is the inverse of that. That in looking into one of these rocks, these flowers, these pervasions, as he describes, and the kind of diffuse surfaces of, of color and line and form, which I think we are going to talk a bit more about in a moment, they, mm. they impact me in such a different way. 
And again, it comes back to that kind of willingness to, to let go of, of vanity in a way um, through immersing yourself in a sensory experience. It, it kind of, they tend to pull you away or they, they I can only really speak for myself here. They, they pull me away from, from my anxieties, from my sort of cognitive worries. I, I cease to worry about the kind of the practicalities of my life, you know, finance, childcare, um, professional advancement, the things that I have to do in a day, they, they start to kind of fade away the more time I spend with one of these paintings because they are these, um, and I, I want to say distilled, um, but in fact, they're dilute in a way. They're, they're, they're not kind of concentrating something. Instead, they're allowing the superfluous to, to, to be removed and, and bringing it down to the, 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 yeah. the wave, let's say. Yeah, yeah this, this kind of flattening of, of, of formal structures, of, of whether they be petals or porous surfaces of a limestone rock, they, they, become, they blur around the edges. Quite literally, we look at the, the painting behind Calvin. Yeah, I think it's or, something to do with our scope. If you have a bigger hmm. vision, those yeah. uh, those high dynamic range becomes yeah. nuanced. That's mm. why uh, I think the flat surface uh, the artist trying to do or use his energy, he, he was ahead of us to find a method which is mm. hidden in, on mm. the surface. At a, immediately, you won't, you won't feel it. You feel mm. your engagement with the work rather than thinking mm. about the artist's effort. But um, mm. because I was talking to the artist, I was asking him how you achieve such an effect. Mm. And he said it's, 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 it's anti-entropy in, mm. in this way because he, he was anxious in, mm. in terms of his own artistic invention. Well, the, the whole process um, Liu Gofu has been going through is about risk-taking. Every brushstroke could be a risk-taking approach. And it is also a lot of uncertainties on the canvas that the artists have to tackle. And eventually he found the balance. And this artist is really an interesting guy, um, especially working so closely with him. And he will never finish a painting, he said, until the point that, hey, I have to really take the painting delivered to London, we have to stop. But then, he can continue to, to deconstruct and reconstruct and then to deliver this. Um, I think the whole process, I think the artist also trying to, to, to be challenging himself and also a process of like very meditative um, to break through all this risk and uncertainty. And, and it creates such chaotic beauty that attracts so many different viewers, no matter you're from, from, from which backgrounds. I remember in the exhibitions that we, 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 we organized in, in a gallery or in like recently in Masterpiece, and a lot of viewers or collectors, they, have, they, they haven't heard of Liu Gofu's name, but then they were attracted by the painting. And they also found the type of like internal connection when they stand in front of the paintings. I, I, found, I found at this point, it is the value, the universal value that the artist actually sharing with the world. That's very, very contemporary because, you know, sometimes this artist is a very subtle person. Um, he tried to deliver his emotion, no matter anger, uh, anxiety, happiness, you know, the, all this emotion actually converted into brushstrokes and put it in the paintings. And this is also some kind of like status quo of what, how, how Chinese people living nowadays, they try not to really express, too expressive, but they try to be a bit subtle to deliver the emotion. So, so that's why I found on one hand, this is very unique, this abstract painting to be very universal in terms of um, aesthetic appreciation. But at the same time, it's also something that really relates to um, Liu Gofu's own cultural background, yeah. Mm. Now, I think uh, Gofu's, his images, uh, it's, it suggests that, suggests that uh, uh, it has huge capacity. It's organic in a way, because you can see it's growing, but you can't describe it, whether it's heavily influenced by Western art or heavily influenced by Chinese art. It's heavily influenced by whole art, let's say. <laughs> by both, because we now learn everything, or we are not uh, constrained by specific um, 
time line because we how about, was how with, about, hmm. how, about um, how you both um, appreciate or, or interpret the Asian or Chinese aesthetic qualities through Liu Gofu's art hmm. in a more like a, a historical or, or, or cultural contest. Um, mm. Do you think Liu Gofu's painting or uh, his brushstrokes and the way he tried to project or suggest an image actually influenced by Chinese Asian paintings? I mean, for, for me, um, I, don't, I don't see Chineseness in Liu Gofu's work. I mean, I, 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 I'm aware of it. I'm aware of it because I, I you know, know of the artist's biography. Encountering it in your gallery and St. James's in your stand and, and, and Masterpiece Calvin, it feels like, you know, there's a context that tells me this is there. And I suppose in some of them, you know, with the title Rock and then some of the images that have these kind of, um, you know, the Lingshu, the kind of scholar's rock, um, these, these, these forms, they have an implication attached to them. Um, but no, they they don't they don't read to me. They don't immediately have a, a kind of legibility as 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 Chinese ness. There there is a conceptual richness underneath there that we've discussed at length mm. about this mm. this kind of nuanced take on it. And I think it's I suppose perhaps there's a distinctive. Um, I, I wouldn't want to say Chinese approach or Asian approach. I'd, I'd say a distinctive Liu Guo Fu take on mm. uh, on responding to the 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 borders of abstraction. And as Joshua has said, a kind of a particular take on what postmodernism can do, and and I, I appreciate it can be quite a, a you know a, an overly intellectualized term that can turn people off sometimes. But fundamentally, I think Joshua put it so well in saying this is asking, not telling, um, and this is prompting us to ask questions. It's there's an openness to how we respond to these works, which I think is facilitated by the way that Liu Gofu very delicately treads that line between. Kind of these historical precedents that we've been hearing about, these, these, these rich concepts that he's developed over his career. But no, to answer your question very directly, Calvin, I, I don't, I don't experience him as a kind of fundamentally Asian artist. And I think actually at the core of that is maybe my my own sort of um, uh, habitual response to kind of look for the brushstroke and to look for things. You know, having spent several years in in, in kind of the, the art market, looking at more traditional paintings, that kind of legibility of the mark and that, that ability to try and trace and recreate the process of construction. Perhaps it's because I, you know, I'm less familiar with oil, but certainly I, I can't do that so readily in, in Liu Golfo's painting. And I think that in a sense is, is a very different tick. I mean, I think maybe Joshua can say much more about where this sits in a kind of a lineage of, of, um, of Asian modernisms um, or Asian modernism, um, or perhaps uh, he, has, he has another take, another response to, to Calvin's prompt. I think Mal Malcolm suggests something uh, very well. Um, I very much appreciate. Um, yes, we can say there's not immediate or apparent Chinese-ness into it, because I, if, if it, in my opinion, it, it's because he didn't specifically copy any uh, iconography, mm. but he grasped the essence of mm. Chinese aesthetics. But those aesthetics, is, we can use a phenomenological term, saying we understand the intention behind image making. And uh, the ancient Chinese people already raised it, but it's not specifically Chinese, it's universal. It just mm. uh, later on, there are specific representation um, projects those ideas, then we think it's Chinese. But fundamentally, we think we understand what, what they are. Then mm -hmm. Wolfu had been thinking deeply. He reinvented this because he doesn't want to copy. Uh, and also, uh, that kind of copying or studying the, the methods or patterns is specifically mm -hmm. the issue slow the Chinese art down because we can see repetitions all the time especially in the late um, official recognized uh, Siwan, let's say, those kind of art. I'm not saying they are bad. It's just saying fundamentally, systematically, they do not have too much uh, constructive suggestions. But in order to make something new, you need to go back to the very, ori uh, very origin of thinking about it. Be recently, I've been reading um, Zhu Qingsheng's work. Um, he's writing about different systems from I think uh, he he suggested that the, the Chinese way and the Western way, they kind of split into separate way in the, in the 13th century, Jiotou and Nizan, they both spread in a certain way. Nizan focused on 
calligraphy or shufa, and uh, Giotto uh, more of a representational um, image. But before that, it's still very much not distinctive. It's still universal. So in terms of gene, let's call, talk about it like a gene. We have it. Some, some of the genes are not apparent, but they are still there. But now we, we try to make them reserve again. Then Guofu's one, we can, we can see uh, from, because I'm, I'm Chinese, I'm embedded with this kind of cultural burden, uh, burden or inertia. So I can see the Chinese is there. Um, but I think it's not necessary for Westerners to think, oh, I have to understand in a Chinese way. No, we, we think it, it's very much a universal uh, feeling of it. Everyone can comprehend or get something from uh, or the energy from the surface. And that's how I think Guofu in a way achieved what he wants to do, something uh, with great capacity uh, and also with a very simplistic uh, presentation for you, for audience to, to get into this vastness. <laughs> to, end this, to end this webinar, um, I want to quote Hugo Fu's saying, each person's brushstrokes are the traces they leave in the world. Malcolm McNair, Joshua Gong, thank you. <laughs>